Hello, and welcome to our video audio podcast, Couched in Color. I'm your mental health expert, teen and young adult crusader, and psychological scientist, Dr. Alfie. This podcast reflects my life's work, helping our young people and young at heart identify mental health challenges, disrupt negative patterns, and discover the best versions of themselves. I'm so happy that you've joined us. For over 20 years, I want you to know that I've had my finger on the pulse of BIPOC teen mental health. I recognize that historically and currently with these dual pandemics of COVID and racial injustice raging, our young people are suffering, sometimes they're struggling, and always the care that they need is quite scarce. So each week I'm joined by young people, mental health experts, celebrities, and influencers to help us uncover the secrets to healing the hearts and minds of our BIPOC teens, their families, and their communities. Here at Couched in Color, we believe deeply in spreading love and light bolstered by culturally relevant science. So let's dive in. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. Everybody, y'all know I love y'all. I love my Couched in Color audience. It's growing and growing. And I just want you to keep telling everybody about us, audio and video. So if you're listening right now, I want you to know we have a video piece and you need to see my guest today. So you need to go find us on YouTube um, and watch us. And uh, my guest, I need to introduce him. His, uh, his pronouns are he, they. So I make sure I, know, I note that because pronouns are really important. I'm learning, I'm Gen X, but I'm learning, I'm getting there um, about being you know, just honest and open and, and really trying to create a welcoming space around all points of diversity, which we're really gonna get into today. So my guest today is Justin Grays. I want Justin to introduce himself, themselves, and I would love for you, Justin, to talk to us a little bit about, I came to know you through a joint project that we worked on together where you were the moderator and you were amazing. Like you were just so poised, like you were just good. It was like herding cats and you just like juggling the balls and you had us like cooking. And so, um, yeah, so I want you to just talk a little bit about the organization that you represent, the work that you do, and just tell us a little bit about your passion uh, around this issue of mental health. Please take it away. Absolutely. Man, Dr. Alfie, thank you so much. It is an honor and a privilege to be a part of the podcast. Thanks for having me. So man, where to start? I always have a hard time kind of putting what I do and my work in kind of one bucket because I, I kind of pop around to a lot of different areas, but my bread and butter, my pride and joy is my organization, He's on Wheels. But to understand He's on Wheels, you've really got to understand who I am as an individual way before He's on Wheels was ever a thing. So I would start by explaining and mentioning the fact that, like you said, if you're not watching the podcast, you got to see the visual. Um, but even if you are you know, watching it visually, you might not be able to tell that I'm sitting in a wheelchair. I'm a wheelchair user and I have been since I was three years old. And before we even get too far, let me say that I am very intentional about using that language. I am a wheelchair user. I'm not confined to a wheelchair. Yes, I have a disability. You know, I'm not stuck in a wheelchair, anything like that. I'm a wheelchair user. And that language is really, really important to me. Um, I've been a wheelchair user since the age of three, um, thanks to a really rare viral inflammation called transverse myelitis. Um, I won't get into all of the science of it right now, but I'll give you the simple breakdown. It's transverse means across like width and myelitis means inflammation. So it was an inflammation across the width of my spinal cord. And it wasn't the transverse myelitis that paralyzed me. It actually was the surgery that they did to save my life. Um, so they actually had to um, you know, go in and eradicate the infection from my spinal cord. And that result, you know, basically they went to my parents and they said, you know, we can either operate and your son might lose his life because this transverse myelitis very may well spread or we can do this operation and he might have a disability for the rest of his life. Obviously they chose door number two and I'm so grateful that they did. <laughs> My disability is a hundred percent part of who I am. It informs, it does not define me, but it definitely informs all of the work I do and the entire way that I experience this world and experience other people. It's really a, a big part of who I am and I'm so proud of that. So, you know, living with the disability for the past 27 years or so, um, go back about 10 years when I was in college. And that's when I started my work through He's on Wheels. And He's on Wheels is, gosh, it is a little bit of everything, but the three main values are disability advocacy, social inclusion, and community engagement. 
And those three values I promote to no end in and out all around every single aspect of my life. So I do a lot of motivational talk speaks, uh, motivation, motivational talks or sessions with high school students, college students. Um, one time I even did like a fifth grade graduation. That was amazing. It was really cool. Um, you know, Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits all over the place. And I always talk about how important it is to be inclusive and to have service and um, an inclusion mindset at the core of everything that you do. So that's a little bit about my organization and my work spans a lot of different areas. But for the most part, I always like to say that my focus is just making sure that people understand that advocacy across the board, whether it's mental health, whether it's gender identity, sexuality, advocacy is the most important thing that you can do for yourself. And secondarily, inclusion is the most important thing that you can do for someone else. Beautiful. So tell us a little bit about this idea of inclusion, because when I think of inclusion, my mind goes automatically to what everybody I think thinks about nowadays, which is what is it? Justice, equity, diversity, inclusion it used to be uh, right. DEI and then like the acronyms, mm -hmm. acronyms keep jumping around. And now there's another one belonging. So the one I'm most familiar with, I happen to be on the board of Crisis Text Line and um, mm. they talk about JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. So when you're talking about inclusion, talk to us about what that means specifically from your perspective? For me, inclusion is all about just having an open mindset. And, and I talk in my work, I talk a lot about mindset because that is what I think gets in the way most frequently and most, maybe a dramatic word, but most egregiously gets in the way of human connection. And going back to what you said about belonging, 100%, one of my favorite sociological theories, I did sociology in, uh, in undergrad, uh -oh. um, is Maslow's that means, high- yeah. That means you like big words, right? Like sociologists yeah, so use a <laughs> truckload of big words to say right. like little bitty stuff. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so for me, I try to I try to keep it simple. Um, you know, and if, if anyone's listening to this and was not part of the panel that Dr. Alfie and I did together, there was a gentleman named Nigel. Um, I cannot remember Nigel's last name right now, Jackson. but he works for uh, DC. Yes, yes, yes Nigel yes. Jackson. Yes. Works for DC Public Schools, and one quote he said, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mess it up, Nigel. If you're listening, I apologize, but it was something along the lines of, "Affective knowledge is epistemologically yep. Yep. valid." Yeah, <laughs> and yep. I was like, Nigel, what? Like, yeah. Right? I was like, right. Lord, where my dictionary at? Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah. And and he broke it down for us. He just said, you know, all your feelings are valid. That's basically what that means. But I'm I'm not on that end of the sociological okay, spectrum. Got I it. try to keep it yeah. kind of simple. <laughs> Yes, but um, but yeah, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs is um, one of my favorite sociological theories because at it, it basically just states that at the foundation of who and what we are as human beings, a sense of belonging is basically required. And for me, growing up as a person who uses a wheelchair, as a person who identifies as African American, there were little to no times that I felt a sense of belonging based on seeing other people that looked like me. Mm. Now, I felt belonging in different sections of my life. Of course, with my family, I felt the ultimate sense of belonging. And, you know, even in school, people were nice to me. They, and I, I'm very grateful that I didn't receive a lot of bullying growing up, because let's be honest, who's going to pick in the kid in the wheelchair, right? Like, not right. a good look. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but when it came to feeling community and belonging based on those just tangible visual things, it was really, really rare for me. So inclusion for me stems from that, those pretty much those bad memories and not wanting to ever be the reason someone else has a similar bad memory. So for me, it's across, across gender identity, across race, across gender, um, across sexuality. Like I truly don't care. For me, inclusion is all about making sure that you are doing everything you can to help someone else feel a part of the group, a part of the conversation. And one way we often say this is to um, help someone else feel seen. Mm. But I actually try to, I'm tr starting to try to get away from that language mm -hmm. because the idea of feeling seen, frankly, is kind of inherently ableist, right? So, you know, you have to think, okay, how can you get the same point across in the same feeling without necessarily relying on something that indicates ability? So I try to say that I make I try to make people feel felt, <laughs> you yeah. know, that when they're talking to me, I want them to know that I feel with them because yeah. feel is an emotion. It's not an ability. It's an emotion. 
Yes. Um, so that's where inclusion comes from for me. It's it's at the core of, like I said, not just my work, but truly, Dr. Alfie, like how I live, like mm-hmm. every single thing I do, friends, and family, every ounce of my life, I try to make sure that I have inclusion at my core. Oh, I love that. I'd love it. And one thing you said that resonated with me, um, going back to your language about you try to make sure that people feel felt. Um, and mm-hmm. I think one way I've tried to manage that is to talk about it in like this, like holy triumvirate, seen, valued, and heard. I think the emphasis being on mm. valued because the value is the piece I think that speaks to what you're getting at. People, the emotional connection. Um, and I think when we have an emotional connection with people, we do feel valued. Um, I think part that valuing is part of what makes people have that kind of connection with us. And so- Absolutely. Um, as soon as you started- talking about when you say seen, it came right into, I was like, that's ableist. Like it just (laughs) hit me. I was like, I had never thought about it like that. So I really appreciate you sharing that perspective. And I guess what it makes me think about is two things. One, I'm going to ask the question that came to me first when you were speaking. And that question is for someone who's unsure, right? So we have this new, um, I had this new thing I participated in with Charlemagne on Audible. And I'm just remembering the question that was asked to me. And that, that thing comes out next week sometime. But the person who nice. asked me the question is a white person. And he was trying to, he was very delicate. James Altashair, Altashay, I'm shouting you out because you were such a good interviewer. <laughs> and you know, he was trying to ask questions that white people want to ask black people, but don't know how to ask them. Um, right, and I, right. I felt that. So I think my question to you is I'm channeling him because the way, you know, the way he asked the question, some of them questions were kind of out there. And I was like, Okay. okay, James. Okay, I, I'm following. And I want to do the same with you. For people who don't understand or don't know how to create inclusion for someone with a disability specifically. And then let's make mm. it a little more, let's make it additionally, make them have to invest additionally. Someone who's a person of color with mm. a disability, what mm-hmm. do they need to be doing? to create this sense of inclusion. Because I think a lot of times people get stuck. I was going to say something else, but I was like, that's ableist too. People get (laughs) stuck, right? Um, So they don't do anything. So what would you, what are some, I know it's an on the spot kind of question, but what would you, what advice do you give us? Absolutely. No, that's a great question. And it's something that I talk about quite a bit, especially with the people closest to me, um, because I am a very direct human being. You know, I communicate in a very, you know, direct and oftentimes, even if I have a friend who comes to me and says like, oh, well, what I thought you wanted was blank. It's like, "Mm, you know me (laughs) and you know that I'm not really going to give you an implication. I'm going to give you the straight, you know, exact, very direct, you know, verbal language kind of answer. And so to, to answer your question, the first piece for me is it's all about communication communicating. And it actually was posed a very similar question to a a young student with a a talk, a session that I did this um, earlier this week. And they asked, you know, if I encounter a person with a disability, you know, what if I feel awkward? What do I, how do I make sure that I'm not over helping? And at the moment, the question kind of stumped me. So I'm happy Mm -hmm. I had a little bit of time to think Mm -hmm. about this, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But my answer to her, my answer now is communication. And it's an example of this is if you are, let's say you're in the grocery store and you see, um, you see me, let's just use literally me as Mm -hmm. an example. Um, you see me rolling along and I might be about to grab a bag of um, Tostitos chips or something, you know, just a bag of chips off the top shelf. And I'm looking, I'm kind of, you know, almost yearning, like just kind of scanning, looking up and you walk by and you have, you're taller than I am, assumingly, and you grab whatever bag of chips it is that you think that I want and you hand them to me like, oh, would mm. you like these? Mm. That is probably in, in the strangest way is one of my pet peeves. Yep. Because the better alternative there is to ask the question is, hey, I see you're looking, m- might I be able to read something for you? And that gives, you know, me as the person with the disability that gives me the opportunity to respectfully decline, which I often do, um, unless, of course, I need the help of which I will gladly accept <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> with a smile yes. and say, yes, actually, yes. could you grab 
X yes. item, right? Um, so communication is number one, is opening those doors. And that is why I live my life the way that I do, because I want other people to feel more comfortable asking those questions. So, you know, when I'm in that situation, it's very rare that I would ever get, I would actually, I don't think I ever have, uh, knock on wood, um, I don't think I ever have gotten nasty and said, no, why are you asking me that or anything like that? Because I don't want that person to be rubbed the wrong way by an interaction with me as a person with a disability and therefore not have that communication in the future. Right. So so that that's one piece is communication. Second is normalizing. And what I mean by normalizing is to for all of us to play a part in normalizing, helping each other, not just when it's someone with a disability. So if you are, you know, demonstrating care or just trying to be, whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally supportive of me as someone with a disability, but you've also done that five, 10, 15 times over with other folks. You're, you're not singling me out. It, 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 it inherently is no longer ableist because that's the way that you behave and that's the culture that you've established for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by normalizing is how about we all just try to be more inclusive? How about we all just try to care more? That way, when you ask that question of me as a person with a disability or of me as a Black person or you know both at the same time, that intersection, then it's not anything that's alarming because it's been normalized. And that's why I do what I do because I want us all to get to that point. And I know it's a big goal. I but that's what I want is for us all to get to that point where caring and being inclusive and not feeling awkward about asking these hard questions because it's normalized. So important. I'm just taking it in because I'm thinking about two things. One is uh, the idea of normalizing and ensuring that we're always trying to be welcoming and inclusive of everybody. Right. right. Um, because everybody right. is deserving of at least that from us. Like, it, like my mom used to say, I always tell people she's deceased, but my mom used to say, you know, she would say it takes more muscles to frown than to smile. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Right? I love that saying. Yes. Right? Yes. And mm -hmm. so I think it takes more energy to see somebody and actively engage in ignoring them than it does. Absolutely. To be welcoming. Do you know what I mean? Like literally the brother head nod. Right. Yeah. Like right. I do that all the time. Like just make it yes. like, especially with people of color, I probably should be better about this. But whenever I see, especially little kids, a person of color, especially when I'm out in places where there are not a lot of other people of color, I think it's right. the thing that we do. And they don't have to be black. If I see somebody brown, we're like, what's up? Right. Because it's like, yeah, yeah, I see we the only ones up in here. Like, we that's right. Up in yep. this piece or not. And yep. so, right. <laughs> right. Just, Something goes just, down. Can I? Right. You know, right. Huh? Okay. Got fam. It. Like, it's me and you. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I try to think about this, when the example that you gave, I'm thinking to myself exactly what you said. That's because people have taught me, people have educated me on this. And so if I'm walking down mm. and I see it, part of me is hesitant. I was like, well, I don't want this person to feel like I'm just asking them because I see them, they have a disability. So I try mm -hmm. to, I would say it to anybody. Like, I, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, there was an older woman, right? A woman of a certain age. And she couldn't mm -hmm. reach something. I was in Harris Teeter. Sure. And I was yep. like, excuse me, ma'am, is there any way I could be helpful to you? She's like, oh, baby, yes, is an older white lady. Yeah, give me that sugar right there, baby. <laughs> I mean, so it was, and she was like, thank you so much, sweetheart. And so I feel like if yes. you can do that for anyone, then it also is helping you practice. So that right. when the time comes to help a person with a certain set of characteristics, it doesn't feel odd to you. This is just something you would do anyway. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? I completely agree. And the biggest like piece there too, that I always kind of embrace is, you know, even if it's not asking someone if they need help, even if it's just like you said, like that, that um, recognition and helping someone feel as if you you know, are valuing them, even if it's a complete stranger. Um, and so that's why even in, let's use like an example of customer service settings. You know, I am always that person who looks for the name tag yep. and I will drop the name. And sometimes right. people are like, oh, that's weird. Do you know them? And I'm like, no, but they're wearing a name tag that has their name on it and right. calling them by their name makes them feel like this is less of a transaction and more mm. of an interaction. Yes. And that just, that could make somebody's day. You have yes. absolutely no idea. And then going back to the piece of actually, you know, if it is the 
a piece where you can physically help someone, yeah. at least for me, that makes me feel better. Yeah. You know, sure, yeah. I'm helping them by yeah. whatever it is, whether it's picking up, you know, I use often in talks, I'll say the example of someone dropping their cell phone. Yeah. Um, and maybe they didn't recognize it, right? You're walking down the street, you drop your yeah. phone. The number of times that I have accidentally dropped my phone in the middle of an establishment in the street mm -hmm. and probably like, frankly, four or five, this of course was pre-COVID because I don't really yeah. go out anymore. Yeah. Um, but that feeling of not even realizing that somebody's bringing you something that, you know, you didn't know that you lost. Yep. And that feeling just feels so, so good when I'm able to help out someone else. So I tried to do it as frequently as possible so that it is just, it's really just another day when it's an opportunity for me to actually go above and beyond, above, yes. above and beyond to help someone out. Yes, I'll tell Service. you, I tell you, COVID has really, I don't know if it's changed. I know it's changed me, but I also don't know if it's changed the people in my life or whom I encounter who have privilege, right? So let's just talk about one point mm. of privilege, race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the given a part of the DC area that I live in, we live in a part that's not very racially, ethnically diverse, right? It's not very much right. at all. Um, right. There's the north side of town and the south side of town. And we all know how that goes. South side of town is all black mm -hmm. and brown. North side yeah. of town is mostly right. white. So we live in the north side of <laughs> right. town, right? The numbers mm -hmm. of white people who go out of their way since last summer to speak and acknowledge my existence as I'm walking down the street with the dog, as I'm running, as I'm with my kids mm -hmm. and we're you know, teenagers and we're running together. We mm -hmm. laugh. Because we're like, a year ago, y'all the same people we would, and y'all wouldn't have said nothing. And I mean, it's so On the same so, street. On this, literally on the same street. And so part yeah. of me is like, I'm grateful because I'm like, okay, good. I'm not the invisible woman anymore. My kids are not the invisible kids anymore. Do you know what I mean? My spouse right. is not the invisible man anymore. Right. But at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, I know y'all only speaking because last summer, right? And so mm -hmm. I have to resist the earth to like, slide myself back into that like negative attribution about it and just you know embrace it and accept it for what it is but the upside of it is is that something happened in our collective consciousness that made people think oh wow when I fail to speak or acknowledge someone's presence that's mm -hmm. hurtful like they've heard somebody right. say this somewhere they say especially after this last two weeks with the horrendous hate crime down in Atlanta yes. right? right so I have yep. a couple at my goddaughter Macy, I claim her as my god though. She's Filipina. She's <laughs> Pina. My best girlfriend growing up was Filipina. And, you know, I'm thinking about them and I'm thinking about all the other Asian Americans in my life. And, you know, right. I saw something, a famous, I can't remember, I think it was Daniel Day Kim, I think. Um, and one okay. of the things he said that really resonated with me, and this is a segue into how all of these things impact our mental health. And what he said was, when you're Asian American, I'm completely like mangling it, but it was something like, it's like you have the ability to acknowledge everybody else in your life, but nobody takes the time to acknowledge you. And I was like, ouch, right? It's that, like that Ooh. severe invisibility. And then, cause I'm a scientist, I was looking right. at um, some data today about kids and COVID and child, they had a breakdown, demographic breakdown. They had, you know what I'm saying? They had white, they had mm -hmm. black, non-Hispanic, non-Latinx, they had obviously white not hispanic and then they had latinx and then they had other and i was like livid i was like in 2021 why are we still lumping people into other other is not a other. racial ethnic it's it's not a thing like that's not a thing so you know for me i'm like if i'm asian looking at that or if i'm native american or if i'm arab mina i'm like that's hurtful because it's like here we go again Absolutely. we just had this shooting happen and you still over here lumping us as other Right. And it's hurtful. Right. And I'm not even a you're member practically of one ignored. of those groups. Yeah, you're ignored. And so talk, talk to me a little bit about, you know, from your experience and the work that you do, um, mm -hmm. that idea of invis invisibility and how that impacts people, young people's mental health. Like, and do you address any of that in the work that you do with public speaking mm -hmm. and, and with your organization? Mm -hmm. I talk about it all the time. And the way that I really try to address it, especially with students, is compassion. Okay. Because that's a concept that I think um, no shade to my generation, your generation, anyone else's generation. But I think Gen Z yeah. is the most compassionate generation, at least in my lifetime. <laughs> um, the way that they are just so 
thoughtful. Um, and of course, this is a, a blanket statement. I don't know yeah, every Gen Zer ever, right? Yeah. But across the board, I just see such a trend in them being that much more compassionate. And when you are compassionate towards someone, it doesn't make them feel invisible. Like that, it's really that simple. Um, and when it comes to invisibility, for me, I think that dis my status as a person with a disability has always really kind of played on my like kind of mental like on my heartstrings because when I was a when I was a kid my mom and dad when I was in rehab actually you know literally learning how to use my wheelchair at, sorry I just cracked my knuckles in the <laughs> microphone hey, you're um fine. when I uh was learning how to use my wheelchair they really gave me two kind of rules that I think they called them literally rules and at the time I didn't really understand them but the older I get the more they make sense and the first one was you know, anything you want to do in life, you can do. Sometimes you might just have to do it a little bit differently. That was number one. But the more salient one for right now in this conversation was that, Justin, you know, people are going to look at you and judge you based on the fact that you're sitting in a wheelchair. Mm. So you have to behave in a way that people see you as an individual before they see your wheelchair. Mm. And as a kid, I was like, what? I'm like, that doesn't really track. However, come high school, especially college, you know, around, you know, 16, 18, 20 years old, that's when I took that piece of advice and I just went off with it because that's, you know, it's around the time I started He's on Wheels. That's around the time that I really started being, you know, this hyper social, engaging, caring kind of person because I realized that me projecting compassion and helping other people feel cared about and valued was a direct avenue to people treating me less as if I was some kind of alien with regard to my disability. Um, and the, I went to school at Virginia Tech um, okay. in Blacksburg, Virginia. And the university, yeah, that's right, go Hokies. <laughs> and the university's motto is ut prosum. And ut prosum means that I may serve in Latin. Mm -hmm. And the the whole ethos behind ut prosum is really, really valuable to me because mm -hmm. if you are living your life with a service mindset and you're interacting with people in a thoughtful, caring way, then everyone's health, mental, physical, emotional is going to be better. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have no crystal ball, but it's the way that I've lived my life for at least the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And my I'm so grateful, and I don't mean this as like a humble brag or even just a straight up brag, mm -hmm. but I am so grateful for the people in my life from my, my immediate family, my two siblings, my two parents, um, to my closest friends. Like I always brag on the people that I love because they are so good to me. And in turn, I am so good to them. And it's really one of those things where I'm just like, well, sometimes I reflect, how did I get so lucky? Mm -hmm. But I really think it is all rooted in making people not feel invisible. Mm -hmm. Because when you're caring about someone, when you're engaging with someone, all of that goes out the window. They feel like they are a part of your community. And I'm not even going to go on the whole tangent about community, but but for me, community is everything. It's it's absolutely everything. So that's kind of my hack around invisibility. And it's something that I practice, especially when I'm uh, working with students, especially high school students. Yeah. One of my favorite things is after a talk, um, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do a talk, I'm up on stage, you know, it's mm -hmm. anywhere from, you know, 20 up to gosh, 3000 students. And every single time, no matter the size of the group, my favorite moments of that talk are immediately afterwards yep. where, you know, I'll hang okay. out because I, I try my best to never do anything too close back to back. Yep. I want to be able to hang out for a bit. And students who, you know, kind of have the gumption to come up, they'll line up on the side of the stage and I will block out every single, I have tunnel vision block out everything else in the room and engage with that one student. Oh. And those are some of the most memorable conversations I've had ever, period, in any avenue, in any medium, in any form. Because that amount of connection, although quick, is so deep. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's just so important for us all to espouse that to, you know, it's a little thing like taking your cell phone, which on my, is on my desk, but right now it's face down because I'm having that's a right. conversation. That's you right. know, being engaging, being present, that's how you get around invisibility. Oh, wow. I wonder if part of what you were taught, right, what you were encouraged to do um, so that people see you and not, this is, this just, this question just occurs to me. Um, do you think that that puts any pressure on you and people like you to 
make other people feel comfortable. I, I just wonder about that, right? Because as a psychologist, hundred percent, <laughs> yeah. As it's like the psychologist mm-hmm. to me is thinking, now I'm I'm just gonna be. I, this is not to cast aspersions on you know what you were taught. It's just a question. I think mm-hmm. to myself. So my parents are civil rights generation, right? Uh, I'm probably close in age to your parents. So that would be my guess. They might maybe older Gen X, maybe. Um, they we might be the same age. Who knows? I had kids <laughs> really late, but um. The civil rights generation, especially with my parents having grown up in Mississippi, this this was them all the time, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. Juan Carlos, yep. right, on a podium. And so there yes. was always this thing about, Alfie, you don't owe nobody, no apology for being Black, right? Before there was this unapologetically thing, that was my parents. And they were like, you don't mm-hmm. need to make nobody comfortable. You just be you, do you, know, do you, you, gonna, you know, now you're going to have to deal with some stuff. But there was this piece of it, though, that was like, pick your battles. Right. Which I don't think millennial, you a millennial, which I don't think millennials and Gen Z, I don't think that's a thing for y'all where it's like, pick your, it's like, mm. no, I'm mad. You did so and so I'm finna let you know. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what cancel culture <laughs> comes from. And I don't necessarily have a problem with cancel culture because to me, cancer culture is about people who used to not have a platform and a voice to say things now mm. have it. And we've labeled it cancel culture. No, you just getting called on your stuff. You messed up. Right. You, know right. you getting called on, so you need to deal with it. So I'm just wondering, does it put pressure on any of us with marginalized identities, parts of us who mm-hmm. are, because mar- we have privilege and you know we have marginalized identities all at the same time. What do you Absolutely. think about that? I think it's a balance because it, you, the answer to your question is 100% yes. And there are some days where I wake up and I roll over and, you know, I'm, I'm looking for my wheelchair and I'm just like, man, you know, it, it usually on days that I've woken up on the wrong side of the bed. Yeah. And yeah, I, I would say that it is, and I mean that figuratively and literally, of course. Of course. Um, and it is for me kind of an opportunity to reset because, you know, going back to what you said about privilege I honor and value the privileges that I do have. Um, and actually, let, let me pause there for a second. I'm going to take a note um, because whenever I talk about privilege, people get a little confused. They're like, okay, wait, so you're black, you have a disability, like you don't have any privilege. What the heck? Sure you do. And you I, educated? Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Let's go. go. Ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, absolutely. And th- that's what a lot of folks don't understand is, you know, your ability to attain higher education. I'm grateful to have earned a master's degree. Okay. I had two parents who, two parents, parents, okay, the privilege to not one, not zero, two parents, okay, who helped me fund my way through higher education. I didn't pay for those degrees, those expensive pieces of paper myself. Okay, so let's first of all, let's have that conversation right around reframing privilege. You know, white cisgender men are not the only people who have privilege. Now they have a lot of it, sure, but they are not the only ones, right? So going back to privilege, I honor and value my privilege because I think it's an important conversation to have. And when I think of my privilege as someone who not only is, you know, someone who has attained higher education and also has had these different opportunities based on, you know, middle class, upper middle class status. I think that there is a lot of responsibility that comes with that privilege for me to not be the, the torch bearer for all folks with disabilities or even all black folks with disabilities. But I know that I have the ability and the energy and frankly, the stamina to do that more often than not. Um, so do in any way, do I think that I'm like, you know, kind of the, like a poster child or do I do it 100% of the time? No, because that would run me down and that's just not sustainable, you know, as a human being, but I, by, by and far, I am so grateful. And that's the way that I choose to frame it is I'm so grateful for that privilege that then therefore it gives me that responsibility for me to be able to do those things, whether it is, you know, just being that person who's more approachable or, um, you know, cause we, we talked a lot, you know, during our panel about code switching, right. And that piece of code switching is something that's kind of probably the biggest challenge that I think I, I receive personally, because if I'm in one room and I'm looking at an audience and I'm doing a, he's on wheel session and it's a fortune 500 company full of Caucasian folks, you know, my presentation and my style and my delivery is going to be a lot different than if I am at a HBCU, you know, if I'm at Howard University giving a talk for a student organization, HU, you know, right. <laughs> my yes. sister went to Howard too, so I'm very <laughs> proud. <laughs> um, yes, so I'm yeah, right. so it's that piece of, you know, code switching and also privilege. Both of those are just so important to acknowledge because they can be exhausting. 
absolutely exhausting to have that weight on your shoulders. But I do gladly accept it because I know that I have that stamina and I'm in that position. And the one other thing I wanted to say on that, you know, as far as picking battles. Yes. I'm the kind of person who I, I'm kind of more of like a Gen Z or in a way, like sometimes it is hard for me to let something go. And you can ask yes. any of my friends, you know, we, you know, let's say we're out at a restaurant and we, we come up and let's say it's, you know, not the most wheelchair accessible. Yes. Right. And yes. now I have some friends, you know, my closest ride or die friends, yes. I, I won't drop any names here today, but you yes. know, I have those friends who will fight for me basically yes. and who will, yes. who will be the ones to say, uh, Justin, you don't have to deal with this today. I'll go talk to somebody. Yes. And oh my goodness, the way that that fills my heart when that happens, Dr. Alfie, yes. like, I don't know if there's a happier feeling, you know, because I'm just so yes. grateful that they understand and they value yes. that. Um, yes. But, you know, that that is definitely the exception. The rule is usually me, you know, advocating for myself. Um, and I, I do have to decide how to pick those battles. And the way that I try to pick those battles mm -hmm. is not just thinking of me as Justin, you know, how is Justin going to benefit from correcting whatever mm -hmm. is wrong in this situation with regard mm -hmm. to ability. But my mom always said, you know, you have to live your life, not just for yourself, but also mm -hmm. thinking of how correcting that and saying something might improve something for the person that's rolling behind you, mm -hmm. you know, and again, a big weight, a big weight, but I do try to think on those bad days when I've woken up on the wrong side of the bed, yeah. it's like oh man do I really want to deal with this today it's like okay even if I don't let me let me wring that towel out let me try to yeah. find that last ounce of energy because yeah. even if it doesn't help me directly maybe it'll help someone else yeah. um so yeah it, it's a challenge and it's definitely exhausting um on days but it's it's also just part of how I'm built you know you can probably tell I'm very extroverted and and I, I think that's a blessing you know I'm so grateful for that because it gives me this extra little nugget of energy to be able to do these kinds of things on a on a constant basis oh Justin that's beautiful mama sounds so wise go ahead mama oh like 10 out of 10 my mom is 10 out of 10 <laughs> <laughs> get a mama I love yeah. it so shout out to your mom I um yeah. wonder about this piece and dad too let's not forget pops pops yeah we don't forget daddies yeah, we love daddies too daddies are the bomb, dads are the bomb. <laughs> shout out dad shout out justice Day. yes um, mother dear and pops as i like to call them Ten oh out that's so sweet all right but you're right <laughs> it is a privilege to have both of those people in your life because there's so many people who don't right. have right both for Absolutely. various reasons um right so i think that's wonderful there's something that you mentioned that really stood out to me as important um, part of it had to do with how you make decisions about which battles you pick. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's good having a process and thinking about in an altruistic way, even if it doesn't help me, it's going to help somebody coming behind me, which makes me think of Kamala Harris mm -hmm. and how she made, I love her, obviously she went to Howard, like mm -hmm. we in the same sorority, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, she a sister. Nice, so nice. All good. Um, I but I love... My sister's AKA also. Oh, is she? Uh, uh, oh, mm -hmm. wait, but the sister's a Sarah yep. too? Okay, let's yes. go. I love it. All these points around the Grace family. I'm like, okay, I need to like right. embrace all y'all. This is awesome. Let's go. That's right. <laughs> um, but how she talked about basically like paraphrasing her, I guess it was her mother who told her, when you go through a door, make sure you hold it open for the people coming behind you. And the piece where she, what I really love, she said, is don't be bound, is I'm just completely mangling it, but don't be bound by other people's perceptions of who you are and what you can do mm. because their perceptions mm. are based on what they've seen and what they've never seen. That doesn't have anything to do with you. Um, right. and so as you talk, that's what it makes me think of is that you mm. are creating a space for yourself um, in, a, in a space in many ways for other people, I, the visual, I'm very visual, is like the waters are parting. And as you're, you know, rolling through, you're, mm -hmm. you're keeping like this draft behind you so other people can walk behind you, right? You're like the, yeah, that's yeah, what it is. <laughs> I love that analogy. That's amazing. I love that analogy. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's beautiful, 100%. right? And at, and at the same time, you find a way to, as an extroverted person, acknowledge who you are. And you're also strike me as a very centered and not happy as in giddy, but just a happy person. And so I guess I'm wondering, Thank you. how do you build and maintain that given, you know, it's a lot of heavy stuff that we're dealing with right now, but how have you, and I'm, we're not even going to get on going to a PWI. I'm just curious because I have degrees from three <laughs> and mm. they all pale in comparison to my experience at Howard. So I just wonder, mm. yeah, like there's just no comparison. Like I, I'm one yeah. of them Howard fanatics, probably like your sister. I'm just crazy about Howard. I but love it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> how do you take care of yourself and maintain, you know, you went to Virginia Tech, you're a person who readily identifies as a wheelchair user. Right. You have mm -hmm. you're a black, right, human being. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. With all of those pieces of your identity, yes, you have privilege. Of course you do. How do you maintain a positive outlook and take care of your own mental health as you navigate the world with all these intersectional pieces of your identity? Yeah, it's challenging. It's it's not a breeze. Um, what I was about to say is it's not a walk in the park. Yeah, but I we're gonna understand. have to come up a good revision with the ableist for language, that. Right? That that's, ableist, it's right? Not a right? stroll. But can you can stroll? You can roll and you can walk when you stroll. So we're gonna go with that. It's not a <laughs> stroll in the park. I like it. <laughs> and 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 that's part of what we do too. You know, is making being willing to make those mistakes and calling yourself out. Right. That's that's so, so, so important. So I always tell people start start where you are, start from where you are and work to improve. Right. So not intentionally being ableist here, but, you know, going to have to come up with a great one for that. Um, so how, how do I maintain? And, you know, for me, self-care is central. You know, I'm so flattered what you said about being centered, because that's what I that's a goal. That is definitely a goal of mine. Um, and on various days, I might not meet that goal. And on some days I knock that goal out of the park. Um, but for me, self-care is extremely important. And what does self-care look like? Ironically enough, I basically call it hibernating. <laughs> um, and anyone who knows me real well knows that there are just some days, especially after, you know, let's say I've had three or four he's on wheels things back to back. And, you know, on top of he's on wheels, I have a day job, um, you know, and so I'm doing that and, you know, that's going crazy and there's a lot of family stuff going on, et cetera. And then I will pretty much shut down for, you know, two, three days and I will go completely off screen. You know, of course, I have my phone around because if mama calls, you got here's the phone, yes. right? But, you know, I will mama go into do that. not disturb. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I will truly go into do not disturb mode, but both, you know, virtually on my iPhone and me physically, because for me, I need that space to recharge. And no matter how extroverted I like to think I am, I definitely like that ability to just kind of be alone and be present with myself. Um, and it's not, it's not, you know, uh, you know, like just sitting around reading a book, staring at a wall. For me, it's just being alone. Maybe it's organizing the house, you know, it's cleaning, um, you know, maybe it's taking care of my dog and just really spending a lot of quality time with her. You know, it, it always has looked different um, at different phases of my life. And it just depends on whatever is stressing me out. Um, but by and large, when it comes to just usually my biggest issue is that I spread myself a little too thin, you know, I'll, I bite off a bit too much that I can chew. And I think that's something that we all kind of struggle with is that balance of making sure that we're not spreading and over our over exerting ourselves. Um, when that happens for me, it's all about me fixing my physical environment. So it is a lot of organizing. It's making sure that my space is at a place so that when I have fully hit reset and I'm fully recharged, then I can jump off again. Because one thing to kind of give you an insight just to how my my brain and my emotions operate is I actually place sometimes an unhealthy amount of value on being productive. And that is also something that I'm working on, you know, to get real vulnerable here mm -hmm. is that for me, having something to show for how I've spent my hours that day is so, so, so important. If I'm not as productive, then I don't have as high of a self-worth. And that's not okay all the time for me. <laughs> you know, I, I like to make sure that there's a balance of, okay, Justin, you know, you didn't get a lot done today, but that's okay. Um, because God willing, tomorrow will be another day and we'll have another opportunity. And then that self-care is really, um, that second piece of self-care is just giving myself that grace of being able to say like, okay, today was today, tomorrow's tomorrow, we'll hit reset and we'll try again. Um, so really just having a lot of patience with myself, self-care and giving myself that grace to know that, you know, my intentions, you know, nine times out of 10, just about are always really, really good. So if I'm just doing my best, you know, powering forward, then I just have to say, okay, like self-care is going to have to be it. I'm going to shut down for the rest of the day and we'll try again. So yeah, it looks different at all times. And it's always, it's a, it's a spectrum, but as extroverted as I am, I try really, really hard to make sure that I still give myself that space to recharge. Wow. So self-care and extending yourself grace are a big part mm -hmm. of your routine and hibernating when you need to hibernate to recharge. That's right. I think that's beautiful. I would also add to you and to everybody who's listening in or watching, I understand that compulsion to be productive and that pr productivity is a, an assessment tool that we use, right, for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so what mm -hmm. I'm going to say to you is something that someone said to me and it just really, this was in the nineties when I was in graduate school and it really just, 
I feel like it fundamentally changed my life because it helped me have a different understanding of myself and the world. And that thing is when you're feeling that urge to measure yourself about your productivity, I say this all the time across all my social channels. It's just so meaningful to me. Come back to the thought that Justin, you are valuable just because you exist. Mm. Mm. Your existence in this world is enough right? Being like me looking at right. you and being able to see, and I can see just a little bit of your wheelchair, like, like the little black mm. arm, like I can see just yeah, a little bit yeah. of it, right? Yeah. Your existence in this world is valuable because there's some kid, right? That maybe they're not a black kid. Maybe they're another kid of color. Maybe it's a white kid who either just got into a wheelchair or has just learned they may have to be in a wheelchair or has been in a wheelchair a long time and is feeling isolated. Yeah. We'll see you Mm -hmm. even before you open your mouth and just be like, oh my God, he's like me. And you haven't even done anything. Absolutely. Just by living, just by being present. Mm. That's it. So just Absolutely. always, I hope that, you know, I don't do too much preaching on my podcast, but if, <laughs> if there's ever that, anytime you feel that, just coming back, that's one of those two or three revelations that I got in my life when somebody shared it with me. And I remember the first time I heard it, I just like sat there. I just burst into tears. I was like, oh, uh, I don't have to do anything. You know what I mean? I don't have to do it. I don't have to right. be the smart black girl. I don't have to be the advanced class black girl. I don't have to be you cute for a dark skinned black girl. Like I can just be me, mm -hmm. period. Right. That's enough. Right. That's enough. So I just want to thank you. I love you. that. Thank you for yes. that. Of thank course. you so much for that. Of course. Of course. So I'm wondering, as we wind down a little bit, are there any things that I forgot to ask you about? I would, you know, I don't care if it's like, you feel like it's off topic. You need, I need you, I need to hear you say it. Let me start there. So let me ask, are there any things that I didn't ask about that you would really want to share with us, with me and my audience out there? There is one thing I wrote down here that, um, you know, I was taking some notes as we were going and you mentioned cancel culture. Yeah. And cancel culture is, um, and this is a, a little off topic, but it's just it's really been on my mind a lot lately. <laughs> cancel culture, I think we all, you know, are kind of aware. And even if we're not, let me just state, I think it's very toxic. Yeah. Um, and I think that you are spot on of, you know, not only us uh, folks not now having a platform, yeah. you know, because social media is ubiquitous. People yes. have a platform on which to call people out. Yes. Um, I would argue that the current generation, even those from previous generations, the world that we live in now is holding folks to a higher standard, yes. rightfully so, in my opinion. Um, all of that to say, when it comes to ableism and cancel culture, um, I encounter a lot of folks, especially in talks that I do specifically on ableism and ableist language, who basically demonstrate that they have some kind of fear or hesitation because they feel like they're going to mess up. Um, and, you know, I said, I mentioned earlier, start from where you are and make small incremental improvements. Um, as it relates to cancel culture, I would also say that we have to, at least for ourselves, transition to what I like to call a council culture and understand each other and say, okay, like, okay, maybe I said something that was a little ableist. Hmm. Let me call it out. Let me correct it. And then also let me evaluate why I said that. Um, and then brainstorm an alternative. And, and I did that in real time, you know, like, yeah, you know, that's yeah. what I do almost always is whether it's something that I say, you know, calling someone, you know, outside of their pronouns, like you mentioned at the top, you know, pronouns, extremely important, yeah. whether it is, you know, an ableist statement, um, a, a racist statement, I think it's important for folks to identify it, call it out. And especially if it's for yourself or someone you love, someone that you want to continue a conversation with, consider a council culture instead of a cancel culture, because that's how I think we all improve. I think that's those conversations going back to inclusion and community engagement. Like it's, it's all one in the same is if we mess up and we immediately pounce on each other and we call people out in a, in a non-productive, non-constructive way, that's not going to convince that person to change. But when it's yourself and when it's someone that you love, someone in your life, a friend, a family member, a spouse, uh, anyone who is, you care about, if you transition your mindset to a cancel culture and have that conversation 10 times, I think, 10 times more likely to change that behavior and not to just change it, but to understand why they should change it. And then that change comes from within instead of being this cancel culture, doom and gloom, you know, 
kind of rain shower kind of uh, mindset. So, so yeah, that's really been on my mind a lot lately. And then the only other thing that I think I would mention is just as far as he's on wheels, I always encourage folks, um, my friends, and even just folks who come to my sessions to, to feel like they have that safe space with me. Um, because, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier and kind of, you know, being that torchbearer, sometimes it is very challenging and a little um, exhausting, but I often think of myself as, you know, a person who has the patience <laughs> and has the, the perspective um, and also is very grateful to have that education and that language to help identify, okay, well, maybe this is where this person is coming from and then kind of help bring them around. So that, that's all He's on Wheels is about is just that compassion and helping folks understand that inclusion. It's, it's not easy. It's not automatic, but it is more than anything, it's important. And if we are not having conversations like this about intersections and connecting with each other, then we might as well just not be human beings. You know, we have this gift of language. We have this gift of communication and emotion. We might as well use it to connect with each other. Mm. Why? Just so much wisdom, wise words. I just am so deeply grateful to you, Justin, for just who you are and how you show up in the world. It is just deeply meaningful. Uh, and I even felt that the first time we uh, were together on that uh, event that we did together, that you mm -hmm. moderated. And I remember yeah. when our colleagues were describing it, it was our, the Our Minds Matter colleagues. They were saying, yeah, mm -hmm. you got to we have a moderator. His name is Justin Braves. He's amazing. And I was like, okay, I got to meet this person because they talking about how amazing he is. So, um, <laughs> and they were right. So I, I just want to thank, thank you again you. for taking the time. Um, would you share with people where can they, you know, you guys run your socials. Can you run your socials down for us and where can people find mm -hmm. you? And if they're interested in even maybe having you come speak, um, you know, I know we're still virtual, but how can they find mm -hmm. out more about He's on Wheels and about our dear friend now, Justin Graves? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for the invitation. So I am He's on Wheels on everything. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram, of course, I'd say Instagram is probably the easiest and most active way to find me. Um, and then also, um, I have a blog, he's on wheels.com. And I'll spell it out just for convenience. He's on wheels is spelled H E S O N W H E E L S. So yep, he's on wheels on everything. And as far as speaking, there is um, actually a speaking request form right there on he's on wheels.com that folks can fill out, you can shoot me an email also through the blog. Um, and oftentimes I really, a lot of my uh, presence um, with speaking events actually happens organically through social media. So I'll, I'll get a DM from someone. So I always tell people, don't shy away from DMing strangers, you know, as long as you're coming correct, you know, and you're, you know, you're doing it the right way, you know, feel free to reach out to me and um, let's continue the conversation as speaking engagements, anything. Um, I just, I love connecting. And I'm surprised one thing I didn't mention um, in our conversation today is that I actually have a goal of meeting one new person every single day. And I've done that since I was 18. So going on 12 years now. Um, and I'm, I've not been successful 100% of the time, especially in COVID. Um, but yes, I one of my best friends in this entire world, his name is also Justin, ironically enough, I met through my goal of meeting one new person every day. <laughs> um, so yeah, please feel free to reach out. I, I've never met a stranger, truly. Um, I just love connecting with people, especially if it's about important work, like everything that we've talked about um, here today. So yep, he's on wheels everywhere. Well, Justin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your spirit. And I will say to you, one of the things that I'm going to take away with me today um, kind of paraphrasing a little bit of what you said about how people need to reach out to you in the DMs. They need to reach out to you in a spirit of council culture, right? Rather yes. than cancel culture. So if they're going to come to mm -hmm. you, maybe not trying to change anything, but it's just that positive spirit of let me share something with you. Let That's me make right. a request of you in the right way rather than cancel culture. Like you need to come do this because you know you need to help the people and this, that, and the third, right? Rather than That's this, right. This, this council culture, I'm going to credit you everywhere I use that. But now you're going to see that showing up in all my socials. I'm going to be like, okay, Justin Graves taught me council culture, I love it. cancel culture. <laughs> so just thank you so much for who you are, everything that you represent. I was getting ready to say something ableist. And I found out like, oh, don't say that, um, right? I love it. Thank you <laughs> yes. so much. I appreciate yes. it. Thank yes. you. Yeah, but thank you. So there you have it. 
that's a wrap for another episode of Couched in Color. We want you to know that we deeply value you, all of our viewers and our listeners, and everyone out there working to support optimal mental health, both for themselves and for our young people. Now, one of the best ways you can help our movement is by leaving us a five-star review on our YouTube channel and everywhere you enjoy your audio podcasts and by sharing our podcast with a friend. Please also tag us while you're out there listening and watching. Finally, head on over to dralfie.com for more information about me, www.acomaproject.org for information about my nonprofit. And those are the places you can go to learn more about how you can help. So I'll see you next week. And until then, I'm going to say what I always say, which is that I'm wishing you lots of love, lots of light, and that I'm hoping it is always, always informed by good culturally relevant science. Take care.